Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I would like to extend a very warm welcome all participants to the 13th Halal Science Business Industry and Business Virtual Conference in Thailand Halal Assembly 2020 under the concept Halal Sphere and Ecologic Economic Equity Concept of Halal. My name is Nurisan Mahamad. It's my pleasure to be Master of Ceremony for today. First of all, I would like to inform you of today's program. The conference will start with the first session on the topic Digital Catalyst and Resilience of Future Halal Industry in this morning. After that, there will be a lunch break and praying for one hour, and then we'll start the next session in the afternoon. Of course, today is our honor to say that have an honorable guest and speakers with us today. Okay, on this occasion, I would like to start the first session on the topic Digital Catalyst and Resilience of Future Halal Industry. May I introduce moderating this session, Assistant Professor Dr. Paradon Suri Pong, Assistant Director, the Halal Science Center, Chulalongkorn University, and Associate Dean on Research and Innovation at College of Arts, Media, and Technology at Chiang Mai University, Thailand. His area of expertise, media and technology, digital platforms, marketing, mobile computing, and business applications. Please welcome Assistant Professor Dr. Paradon Suri Pong. Thank you, thank you, Nurisan, for, for introducing me. Okay, uh, then we have very interesting topic here today. We have uh, four keynote speakers, and uh, we have three presenters here, and one video from, from Dr. Panan. Uh, not to waste the time, I will bring you directly to the core of the session, which is the panelists. And the first uh, speaker in this panel is Professor Dr. Frida Hassan, the founder of iHalal Management and uh, Science uh, from University Technology Mara Shahalam from Malaysia. So uh, each speaker will have uh, around 15 to 20 minutes for presentation and we will have the Q&A uh, at the end of all speaker when, uh, when all speakers finish their session. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Farida, you can start uh, your session now. Thank you very much, uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Pradhan. Uh, allow me to show my slide share my slide on the screen. Just a minute, yeah. All right. Um, let me put in the first slide. Sorry about that. Okay, got that. All right. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. A very good uh, morning in Thailand. It's really afternoon in Malaysia and Singapore. Um, my name is Farida and I'm currently from INCA, University of Algimara, uh, and also the Deputy President for the World Academy Islamic Management, or known as YIM. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Pradon, sorry, Ass Assistant Professor Dr. Pradon for um, moderating our session and also my salute to all my panelists here this morning for sharing a lot of things uh, in marketing we share the same background and uh, the i also like to thank um, the organizing committee um, uh, especially prof minai and 
also the team Najwa, uh, Nujmi, and um, and uh, Marisa, who has been in touch with me from time to time. Now, my title for this morning is actually on tools analysis and ASEAN halal food marketing. A lot of you are very familiar with SWOT analysis, but what I would like to share is a research that my team has um, conducted, and uh, we did an expansion of. Uh, what uh, study and uh, we move in into those uh, strategies because this is the area where we come up with a conclusion and, and also recommendation. Now, um, I changed the title quite recently because initially I wanted to do Australia, but I feel that uh, because ASEAN was given to Turkey yesterday, but I decided to uh, do all the changes because I think ASEAN would be close to our heart and I covered Africa in for the turkey halal yesterday all right without further ado let's take a look at uh, the things that I'm, I'm going to cover if there's any q a from you you can just whatsapp me at this number or just email me at this number all right at the email address and this is the outline that i'm going to share with you which is um, on the purpose the design methodology the findings using two tools and ethical tools and uh, touching the research limitations as well as the practical implications or the conclusion as well as the recommendation and then um, i would also highlight on the value of doing this research now i'd like to thank my uh, research team hamisa delvino and or Ain for you know collecting a lot of information especially on secondary data because um, unless we are being hired to conduct the perception studies and surveys we don't mind visiting countries to countries that we did under the ministry before in order to get more insight uh, of the of the of the case uh, studies that we are handling on this ASEAN region okay a little bit on the introduction um, the halal industry basically comprises three main sectors, food, non-food and services, and everybody knows what's the meaning of um, halal, but I think I would like to uh, highlight the key word over here in marketing. We talk about halal, we're talking about permissible food or services that if a Muslim were to consume it, then I would grant you all the ummah, meaning any human mankind should also um, consume it because it is safe okay but if we do not stamp the halal logo then if it's not permissible if it's not lawful i can guarantee for you that i would be the testimony for it if it is not safe for me it will not be permitted for you to even be near to that kind of food or services that we are uh, marketing so halal haram is actually governed by the sharia islamic guidelines but to, for those of you who like to know whether old whether old whether this is only applicable to the Sharia Islamic guidelines, uh, I would like to correct that because for those Jewish people, these are the people of the book and also the Christians who really adopted the, uh, the guidelines of uh, food uh, governance, uh, they are about the same, okay? Because except that the Jews, um, their practices are even more stricter and rigid than the, the Muslims' uh, Sharia guidelines. Okay, so the world population is such, and uh, I think by now you would understand why purposely today I would like to highlight on the ASEAN uh, continent because we um, have a big number over here, okay? And uh, so this this population is, uh, is tremendous for us to take care. Um, it's about 1.4 billion, which is bigger than the China's largest population um, populated country in the world as compared to many others. So secondly, followed by Africa and Europe. Now, um, these are the, the extent of the, I would say, growth of the, um, uh, all the beliefs of the, uh, I would say, world population. And, um, and, and, and it, it changes from day to day, year to year. So top on the list right now is the Islam Sunni. And uh, we also have the other group, uh, the Shia group okay so they are also muslims and uh, they also practice the the, the uh, principles of the uh, good uh, goodness of food and services yeah so you look at these our population are mainly concentrated over here and we have almost 60 percent and uh, we have to really you know uh, help ourselves first and you know 
uh, understand the product services of halal and then uh, market it. Uh, and before we do that, we have to testify it first. Yeah. So okay, the Muslim population, everyone knows this. Um, most of of the seventy five percent and above are in the dark region here. Uh, the Indonesian, followed by I think this is Pakistan, okay, Iran and Tehran and all that. Uh, however, one country is missing over here, which is the second most populated Muslim population, okay, which is India, and the amount of the total population over there is hundred and eighty five million uh, Muslim population over there, which is bypassed or overlooked. Okay, because number one, the population, it is not a Muslim country, but in terms of the number of population, that's one area that needs a lot of marketing and also development of products and services uh, that they need to um, to focus. Yeah. Now, I need to highlight over here that the population is growing in the Muslim world because, and by the Muslim population, is due to the uh, marriage institution that the Muslim believe and still practicing until today and forever until infinity. Because other religion may not practice the marriage institution as rigid or as, I would say, compulsory as the Muslim. Because of those, you know, um, a lot of social, new social lifestyle like LGBT or uh, cohabitation or many others, okay? So they have a new social development over there. So, but as far as Muslims are concerned, it will keep on growing, the population will, 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 will keep enhancing, and uh, you, can, you have family of procreation um, from time to time. So it will be a strong community. So the problem statement over here that I would like to highlight using the SWOT analysis is to highlight this uh, very common tool that everyone knows, strength, weaknesses, approaches, and threats. And it is a selected country that I'm uh, appointing in Asia based on the availability of the literature. Okay, If we want to need to do more in new countries, we need to be, uh, someone has to engage us to do the, the survey uh, to understand better for that particular country, especially before you mark to that country. We need to understand the culture, the social, economic, and political uh, background of the country. So the second problem or the issues would be to look into the acceptance of Muslim countries and non-Muslim countries towards halal food because the non-Muslim countries right now are practicing this because they have understood the value as well as the, I would say, uh, importance of why halal food is, uh, is, is a demand. I mean, for example, if COVID is the cause of, you know, eating bats and all that, bats is an animal that Muslim does not eat, okay? And there are a lot of other animals that we are not supposed to eat because it does cause danger to us. So why are we exposing ourselves to danger, you know, when we can avoid it? And finally, from the SOAR analysis, we will proceed to another level, which is known as post analysis, and you want to know how to really conduct this, you have to engage me personally and my team to, to help you to do it for your company. Now, the objectives over here actually are divided into four. Number one, to explore about halal food marketing in the ASEAN countries. And I would say, again, selected ASEAN countries based on the literature review, because only by literature, you, you can assure that these uh, documentations are valid, yeah? which is not a hearsay study. Second, we're looking into the consumer perception of acceptance of halal food. Now, before you market anything, you have to understand the way they think, the motive why they buy, and many others. Yeah? So these are all on the consumer's behavior. Then the third is to look into the toast analysis. And finally, I am forwarding the best market strategies that uh, I, that my team can come up with for any marketers out there who like to adopt and uh, market the product in these parts of the world, uh, selected countries that we have chosen. So the scope will be such, but the limitation would be, uh, as I've mentioned to you, not focusing on every country in Asia and the other one, as I've mentioned, uh, dependent on the literature uh, review only. So this is this. The, if you open up a book known as Craig David, you'll find that this is the step that you uh, how to how you conduct the SWOT analysis. But my team, uh, we went further to look into the strategies by matching between the SWOT and come up with the close analysis. 
So one would be the internal, the other one would be the external. Now, this is a wealth of information that I'm sharing with you about the ASEAN Muslim population. You can see the growth from time to time. Okay, I'm not going to go through that. Uh, okay, now, in terms of summary of literature review, I am not going through the details, but I would like to share with you only the, um, you know, key points over here, like in India, you can see over here that the young consumers are particular about the cleanliness and hygiene factors while making any decision based on a study in 2019 by Yusuf et al. In Japan, the halal component would add value to the overall food chain in Japan as far as Muslim consumers are concerned. In China, the adoption of certain uh, Islamic food production practices could build confidence and put China on the map as a major producer because they are the biggest in the world, you know, in terms of um, labor as well as resources and many others here yeah, that they can help to market the food. Now, in the ASEAN halal market, the perception of halal product is higher in the East ASEAN as well as Middle East countries. Uh, a study based uh, uh, on the consumer's behavior perception by Nor Afni and the group, the halal certification is a bridge to penetrate into the global market because having certification is a guarantee, is a promise for those countries, especially that uh, I would say dominate as well as champion uh, the, the, the process and accreditation. So other than that, their study also said that the product is safe and not harmful to animals, okay, and also environment. So they also touch on the green environment. So we're not only talking about to human mankind, even animals would consume it would be safe, you know, to 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 um within uh, adopting such lifestyle. So other than that, I would like to highlight in Malaysia we already adopted the SWOT analysis uh, using as a guideline in order for us to come up with strategies and uh, the halal food supply chain study also uh, make a farm to fork global supply chain models in order to understand the critical awareness of each point yeah, without, turn, uh, without turning any stones uh, unattended. Okay, so the acceptance of halal is uh, due to the increasing awareness, uh, not only on religious obligation, but it do, does contribute to the increasing demand for halal products and services. Typical, typical example would be Malaysia. For the Muslims in Malaysia, they believe because of religiosity. There's no two way about it. For, but for the non-Muslim who live in Malaysia, they have already, uh, from our survey, they have already uh, denote uh, that Halal is a guarantee or promise of cleanliness and quality of food and services. So this, this thing, uh, Malaysia would be a good example to test the market before we, we go into other parts of the world to promote it. And uh, the next part that I would like to highlight to you is on the uh, Middle East and Asia uh, on the global corporate halal strategies. They are becoming uh, more connected as well as um, unified in order to understand each other via regions. Yeah? If it is not via continents, it is via regions. Okay, in Taiwan, the government had encouraged more companies to get halal certificates, which is a good sign. And in Malaysia, the encouraging halal market potential is not only from the result of food product alone, uh, it goes into the lifestyle like logistics, tourism, pharmaceutical, healthcare, and many others, okay? So, that's done with the literature. These are the state of global is Islamic economy, the top 10. Um, you can see the same countries uh, in practically all the aspects, finance, food, Muslim friendly travel, modest fashion, media creation, and pharmaceutical. These are being rated uh, not by the country, this rated by the global Islamic economy. You can see a few countries keep on uh, being rated highly. So that, that's, a, a, I would say, a strength of a brand of a halal assurance there. Yeah? Okay, this is a methodology on how we do this research. Uh, and then I'll go into the finance analysis. This is what I wanted to share with you. Most of you are very familiar with the strengths, weaknesses, approaches, and threats. It needs a lot of brainstorming in order to come up with the strategies over here. However, I'm coming up to the last two slides here, okay, before I end up this um, uh, presentation. What I wanted to share over here in conclusion is that halal executive uh, is still needed right now because the, the halal cost would also expose people on new issues because issues keep on coming in and out practically every day. 
you know that scares the the uh, the the public as well as the consumers. So you have to be um, you have to understand better master in the in the halal um, uh, education before you champion as well as educate others. So that in that way you can strengthen the the halal branding. Other than that, uh, it is well accepted in the Islamic lifestyle uh, countries. Uh, more so if you are ready to provide transparency and information loaded about their products, especially labeling, you know, the details of ingredients. There's no secret about it, you know. There's no such thing as 50% halal or 50% haram or 70% or 90% halal. If it is halal, it is 100% halal or 1,000% halal. Now, other than that, there needs to be a good perception about the product that you are marketing to avoid any manipulative, excessive and deception promotion on halal product. Take note, in Malaysia itself, we had a lot of cases like Cadbury case or Gardenia uh, uh, bread and many others. Even Spice water, okay, mineral water because please remember, once the consumer have a bad perception about this product, your whole brand is a total damage. So before you make any losses, you make sure that your quality of assuring halal is consistent and forever guaranteed that it is halal. It's no fun hearing that all oh, this these people are mispracticing for the last 10 years, 20 years, how many years. They do not only believe in your brand, they do not also believe in your country that market it so be careful on that yeah so you have to synchronize uh, it, for the universal world you have to synchronize the promotion ethics of doing it yeah if it is wrong it is wrong if it's unethical you have to uh, claim it yeah and other than that look into the pricing strategies and to strive to introduce halal literacy to individual con consumer level first especially the young ones because they, they they need to be educated and you have to be proactive in enforcing halal certificate because without the logo that has been acknowledged or been accredited or being audited then anybody can come up with any halal logo you know like a backyard halal logo that's very very wrong so create an awareness on the halal food brands put it on the website where people can check it out right now via it and other than that you can implement the laws and the acts to ensure all halal food marketers use authentic halal logo and finally a recommendation please as a marketer uh, you need to build and maintain the trust and uh, the price must be reasonable. This is not a money-making economy. Yeah? It is first a guarantee of the goodness of the products and services. The, the income, the revenue would just come naturally once your product is labeled as good quality. And other than that, it has to be customer friendly. Halal is meant for all. It is not for elite people or exclusive people. It has to be made applicable right now, especially uh, via IT, okay, user friendly. So we try to fully optimize all the research centers, especially like in um, Halal Science Center where Prof. Wina himself was the dean of the uh, applied science and later came up, you know, for applied science to do more research into halal. So this is the, the, the nucleus of it. And other than that, provide more empirical scientific research because people do not want to hear her hearsay. Somebody says this, somebody says that. There's no citation reference. And uh, when you become a halal consultant, be one that is really responsible and accountable. Okay, so encourage more Muslim food manufacturers or producers to strengthen the halal assurance system. Do auditing like in Malaysia, it is twice a year. So there's no time for them to make any unethical practices because it's too short a time before the next audit comes in. Okay, so it's not a, something like a showcase when somebody comes to do an audit, you get everything well in perspective. But after one year, you lax because the next following year, there'll be another audit okay, on the on the halal application. So improve consumer facilities from time to time. We cannot develop a single international halal standard. We have been trying to do this since 2006. But what I can assure you all is that we can work by region, okay? Because regional um, unified halal standard can collaborate and um, JV in the way they market their, their uh, halal products. And finally, yes, you can establish an international halal board of advisor. Make sure in the board you have representatives, for example, like Southeast Asia, 
where we are strong right now. So with that, Dr. Pradong, thank you so much. But before I leave, there's just one quotation over here that says, Muslims are the majority. I'm not talking about in this country, but in Asia. So not having that as clients means that you are losing a sizable market share like in India, about 185 million Muslims where nobody takes care. With that, thank you and Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you, Professor Farida, for the very Welcome. insightful research finding. And, mm -hmm. and thank you for respecting the time. You are very doing very good for our timing. Uh, thank for you so much. The next presenter uh, is uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Panat Nontavanich. He is the, the lecturer in biology at uh, Fatoni University. Unfortunately, he cannot uh, join us uh, virtually. <laughs> with us uh, at this time, but uh, he prepared the slide and the video recorded for our team. So let uh, our organizing team uh, play his video. Uh, dear chairperson, honored guests, moderator, speaker, or participants, and all brother and sister, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. I hope you are all safe and well during this um, pandemic. And uh, uh, we welcome to Lanta Island. I'm here right now. Um, is my schedule stopped during my three week extended trip? Uh, first of all, I would like to say I'm very, really sorry about. Um, I very, very sorry that I cannot join you for the for the for the Zoom tomorrow for the live um, presentation tomorrow uh, because uh, I will have to leave from um, Lata Islands tonight to another um, another island, uh, and by tomorrow morning. I'm not really sure if I'm going to have a decent signal or internet signal um, for do, to doing so. So I uh, prefer to uh, record the video presentation um, here and today. Uh, and second thing is, <coughs> I, I I have to apologize for my for my dress. I don't have a proper uh, proper dress um, proper coat me right now as I told you I on um, the extended trip and I don't really have enough time to go out and buy any um, shirt or things like that and since I have been contact from the organizer uh, very very recently uh, so it's not, not, I, I couldn't find anything I'm very really, very really sorry about that but I, I should um, be more uh, proper formal for this and um, and the third thing is um, since I don't have anything, uh, no, I didn't bring my laptops, I didn't my iPad or or um, anything with me right now. I just have only a telephone with me, mobile phone with me. So I have to work from from mobile phone, and this uh, um, might not be a, 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 um, a good enough uh, presentation. However, I will try to do my best to share my knowledge with. Um, with um, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> my topic is the consumer behavior due to digital uh, marketing in 2021. Uh, <clears throat> this is, um, I would like to, uh, to start with um, a couple of numbers that I found very, very interesting. Uh, um, from the second quarter to third quarter uh, this year, the number of e-commerce was, um, was increasing. Mm, e-commerce was growing about 33, 30%, 32, 33%. And if we if looking um, of the uh, uh, e-commerce from uh, you know, 
uh, year to year basis um, from the, uh, November to December last year, comparing to um, November to December this year. Very, very, uh, very, very um, big number. That means people intend to uh, intend to shopping online more than doing a person-to-person -person shopping, or, or basically um, going to the, the shopping center or, or to the shop to buy things. Which means that online um, shopping is, is is very increasing, and. Um, New audience segment is is, is um, jumping in, especially the older um, generation um, is um, they're increasing their online activity, and older um, generation that's been a, a person who's right around 65 years old or up, um, up to right around like first of all like in Japan uh, people around uh, 65 to 90 years old they're starting to do the, to do to, to evolve in on, on more online activity especially on shopping um, uh, even the uh, products that we're looking at people um, prefer to buy more like um, hobby or, or, or personalized product, for example, like art, craft, some um, cooking, some food, um, all those things, uh, they'll, they'll be for sure uh, to buy online. Um, this is uh, increasing more um, on this area as well. Uh, <clears throat> and the accelerate demand, demand for the sustainable uh, sustainability is increasing. Uh, <clears throat> As we know that when the lockdown was began, uh, the environmental, the nature start to healing. Uh, people start to see a lot of um, good sign. Uh, the water start to clear, to be um, clearer, to be cleaner. Uh, we see a lot of wildlife um, in the park, in, in, in uh, public um, roads, in, in everywhere, <clears throat> even um, around my house, which uh, we didn't live um, that close to the jungle or that, that close to the forest. Um, we still see the wild monkey that um, you know coming out to to out out, out nearby uh, around like um, only like hundred meters away or uh, fifty meters away from from, from, from my resident. Uh, <clears throat> so I think that is is quite um, fascinating that um, that the wiki time for nature. However um, uh, people or consumer start to like that and they, they start to um, to bring that into their life. They're starting to look at the um, sustainable um, way um, or to, to live, uh, first of all, like sustainable product um, like, um, you know, solar light, solar um, power, uh, uh, energy, uh, a lot of um, uh, online um, uh, uh, merchants, uh, they they also bring in the uh, a lot of product, like um, a lot of um, product that's running on Facebook, for example, like um, uh, solar power light bulb, very cheap, very easy to install. Just install it, you know, a little, you know, very easy to to uh, operate, and, and, and they they. They sell baru, um, baru this is, this is increasing a lot. It's very, um, very interesting as well. Uh, and people get um, to be money conscious. And they are um, looking thing in value basis, like um, value basis, like um, when they, yeah, yeah, that's, of course they're buying, uh, they're buying uh, things and what you say, uh, buying less um, less uh, item or less thing, but the aiming uh, for the uh, better quality. That means that they they, would be, uh, they prefer to um, pay less um, to get uh, a better quality merchandise out of it. 
and um, they are uh, price sensitive. That means the most likely to buy their favorite items um, wherever it is being offered at the, the lower price or whoever offer them a uh, lower price and they don't really um, focusing on, on the brand item that much anymore uh, so this means this, this mean that it's, it's, uh, it's creating the uh, private label um, and by um, a lot of demand uh, for the private label. Uh, interesting enough for the brand name to join in the, this market sector as well. So a lot of brand names they also start uh, coming up with their own uh, private private label um, selection for the customer. Uh, <clears throat> and also in this sector the uh, people also looking at the hyper local or on demand merchandise uh, I think during the lockdown during the lockdown is um, <coughs> it's create and somehow it's create uh, the opportunity for some of the uh, local brand uh, for example, like my previous customer who's own uh, a private brand, a uh, local brand of the um, coffee beans. Um, uh, he's selling Arabica, Arabica, Ara, um, I'm sorry, Arabica uh, coffee bean and Robusta coffee bean to the coffee shop. Um, uh, but during the pandemic, he, he covered up. Um, changed uh, his his market from the uh, from the coffee shop. He changed that into the private um, you know private use or, or basically personal use for the coffee beans. Um, yes, of course he's selling on other different um, kind of um, uh, kind of um, beans for a uh, different kind of um, uh, flavor or, or different kind of method of brewing the, the coffee. <coughs> Uh, however, what he did, what he did was um, he made the product more, more exclusive. He made product more customized um, for the customer, and he made product uh, uh, a better control quality. And and by the way, control quality does it, it doesn't mean that he just control in in his own uh, manufacturer uh, or his own plant. He control the product um, from the beginning, from the um, from up the beginning of the, the product. He got the uh, an expert who go down to each farm to select the uh, to select the 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 breed uh, the breed um, the bleedersy <coughs> from each farm, and it, it is uh, he go. Um, he go to the top. He 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 asks his um his guy to select it by hand. Each each um leader seed it will be hand selected. And after that, he will put in a in a special box, special container, and, and label it. And he call his his the identification and passport. That means he can track every single thing um, that's gonna happen uh, to this uh, selection. Uh, or, or this uh, literacy and then he will pass that on to the to the farmer uh, to do the propaganda <coughs> uh, and then they're gonna uh, before the farmer will start to to grow the the, the literacy he will send in the another team to inspect the soil to make sure that the soil is um, have good quality and the amazing thing is that if um, this that, that, that I found out is he didn't use only one uh, area or one um, particular uh, area so uh, he select a few couple of area to plant his um, his his seed his coffee seed his coffee bean uh, <clears throat> and he labeled it 
he um, recorded and put in his database. And after that, uh, when it's harvest, <coughs> the farmer will harvest and send this uh, to the processing plant. And of course, the processing plant, he will, um, you know, identification, he may make, make, uh, put in an application for each uh, farm for each farm's uh, seed, where it's come from, and where it's gonna be laid down, where it's, uh, it's gonna be watched, or, or how long it's got a fertil uh, fertilization process and everything. And after that, <coughs> uh, after it's finished, uh, they will put it in a box, another box, and they will, they will send it to the his roasting um, plant, the which uh, where he have, uh, he create, about like two to three hundred um, roasting profile, uh, so customer can choose, um, you know, from the roasting profile whichever they want. And as a result, customer uh, feel like they have their own um, custom made um, coffee beans, uh, and it's more or less like that as well. Uh, that's uh, make a customer feel. Um, really, really personalized um, coffee or personalized um, cup of coffee that 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 that, that they made, and um, this create another. Uh, this is um, the, the example that I would like to show um, that uh, in year two thousand twenty one, uh, the product is it might have to be more. Um, concerning with the uh, custom-made uh, product and the value has to be less. Um, it has to be very, very easy to assess. It has to be uh, uh, good quality and, um, and for, the, uh, for the producer or retailer, we have to be um, looking at the um, digital marketing um, because uh, a lot of researchers are agree that um, people was uh, behavior was changed during the pandemic and a lot of people will will, will keep that um, lifestyle I, I continue that, that lifestyle after this um, after this until probably like uh, five or six more year if nothing happened again. Um, <clears throat> I'm really, really sorry that I, I spend too much time. I don't have enough time to um, go over so many, so many details that I, I prepared. Um, but however, if you have any question, um, please uh, feel free to, um, to let me know and I will try my best to to give you the, all the um, answer that, uh, that, that I can. Um, and again, uh, for the last time, I, I hope you are very, very well and please take good care of yourself and your loved one. And I hope that one day, uh, we will um, sit down and, and talk um, person to person, do a seminar and person to person again um, and I'm pretty uh, I, I promise next time I will dress up a bit more proper than this um, thank you very much for your time and I hope to see you again assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh uh, thank you uh, organizing team for the effort for the video and thank you Dr. Panat uh, I'm not sure that you are watching your own video on the streaming uh, I was thinking, is that a virtual background or is it a real background? And when I see the sky getting darker, and I realize that he's really sitting on a beach. <laughs> Lucky you. Okay, then uh, we have very good uh, speaker on the branding, uh, and another one is for e-commerce. Uh, then I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Yusuf Chai, co-founder and chairman of YAP Center for Blockchain Studies from UAE. This is one of another digital catalyst for the Halan industry. Uh, the mic for you, uh, uh, Mr. Yusuf.
and then don't forget to turn on your microphone. Yeah. Salam okay. alaikum. Can you hear me? Yeah, very good. Okay. Uh, dear brothers and sisters and dear audience, um, thank you for attending this session uh, on Digital Catalyst for Halal Industry uh, Solutions. My presentation today is on blockchain, Internet of Things, and artificial intelligence uh, in halal food industry, some concept and experiment in China and beyond. Uh, Today, I'm speaking in the capacity as a founder and chairman of YAP Center for Blockchain Studies, which is a research institute I founded uh, in the UAE to uh, study and research on how um, uh, smart technologies uh, like blockchain uh, artificial intelligence can help us to understand and solve uh, the issues in halal food industry and as well as ethical and policy uh, issues related to these solutions. So today I'm going to, I think you can share, uh, see my uh, screen, right? The, my shared uh, PowerPoint. So uh, yes. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, about four um, air, uh, issue, uh, like points. First of all is blockchain uh, experiments. I'm going to use a startup a company called Halal Chain as a a case study, how uh, see how it was founded and how it was uh, um, facing the difficulties and how they can overcome the difficulties. And second one, I'm just briefly uh, outlining some IoT um, uh, suggestions or experiments, especially uh, something has done in China. Uh, here uh, is more conceptual. I'm going to talk about like how it can um, solve uh, maybe uh, you know uh, help or assist you know, halal food inspectors or food inspecting general in controlling uh, and more quality and safety but to, uh, there are serious ethical and uh, uh, conceptual issues here we need to solve before we adopt this technology and lastly um, I'm going to um, focus on the AI how AI algorithms can be used to guarantee the food safety and quality. And I present you with a case study, uh, a, a, a business proposal uh, established between the China and the UAE uh, to establish Halal Food Industry Park in Dubai as a, as a case study. So how this uh, smart technology can be used in this bilateral uh, state corporations. So let's go uh, to the our first uh, part is the blockchain and halal food and research application. Uh, Doctor Yusuf, apologize me. Can you share the full screen? It's a request by by the organizing team. Can you share as a full screen? Full screen. Okay. We'll just yeah. Screen. Thank you. Now it's fine. Is it full screen now? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So uh, whenever we adopt new technologies, whether a blockchain or uh, IoT or um, uh, AI, uh, we constantly um, got questioned, especially from, you know, uh, if you are in uh, halal food industry or you mean like uh, academic, you know, Islamic studies, Muslim studies, people said, oh, is it ethical? Is it you know um, allowed to be used? First, we need to solve the issue whether it's halal or haram uh, to, in adopting this technology to solve our issues. In particular, like the halal food, everybody consume. You know, there's a 1.8 uh, billion Muslim consumers worldwide. You know, that actually uh, the, could be more. So, as this uh, daily uh, consumption. Um, food, if you adopt technology in assessing, assessing its uh, uh, legality and uh, its uh, uh, compliance with Sharia, will this technology, first you think that you, this technology, uh, are this involved uh, you know, with legal issues? So my argument is it has been repeated by many other scholars from Al-Azhar, from Indonesia, from UAE, 
they have met, uh, they said there is no contradiction between blockchain technology and Islamic finance and halal food, etc. So, uh, if if you allow me to uh, one minute to explain the block uh, blockchain, so this is a, a new technology uh, which based on uh, it's called uh, decentralized uh, uh, data um, ledgers. Uh, basically, using this technology, uh, you are uh, to record your data in a decentralized way, like all the computers in the network, uh, at least 51% of the computers in the network will record the transaction happening between two users. And this transaction will be decentralized, not stored in one place. Uh, like in traditional, we think there's a server, there's a cloud, or there's a bank which serve, uh, serve the data or serve the transaction. But on blockchain technology, it's uh, uh, spread across everyone, you know. And it's also is anonymous and secure. Like if you, it's uh, uh, encrypt. So your transaction is shared uh, or um, recorded, uh, decentralized, but not, uh, you know, uh, but still encrypt. So it's secure. In this, this, this is basically the concept of blockchain technology. So uh, they believe that this is a compliance with uh, um, Sharia. You know Sharia, in that it's removed uh, the um, removed the centralized authority which may breach or the, uh, breach the trust. And it, once the central authority uh, collapsed, then the whole system collapsed. So this is a decentralized trust, like a decentralized uh, trust between the uh, uh, the believers. You know between the believers. So therefore, we think blockchain technology provides solutions to challenges facing the halal food industry and Islamic economy uh, ecosystem today. So in my paper, I kind of analyzed the overview of uh, this, uh, which we published with our uh, co-author, Abdullah Khan Guangyu and Professor Abdul Salam from Nigeria uh, in a peer-reviewed article. It's about how the you know halal food industry can be uh, re revolutionized actually by blockchain technology and uh, most important thing this blockchain can provide user traceability so traceability so all we when we drink this you know for example this halal soup like we simply this is a soup but we know where this come from so from a to z from farm to fork Blockchain technology is posed to uh, solve issues of traceability. So once you um, smart, like you uh, uh, establish this ecosystem by blockchain technology, you are able to trace where is your meat come from, you know, where is your uh, food come from, you know. It, even you can know where is the uh, this cow, you know, this cow is his, uh, his all the descriptions of this. Uh, for example, you're eating uh, beef, where does it come from? And this from production, from processing and from distribution, all will be uh, using the uh, blockchain technology to record the data and store the data and uh, uh, verify the data. Uh, I think one of our presenters, Professor Farida, just mentioned uh, about this thing of a trust, you know, whether people would trust whether your food is really halal. In particular, if you are living uh, Muslim, uh, non-Muslim country, like like China. Even you live in a non-Muslim country like UAE these days. I mean, because of globalization, because of this uh, global logistics, how you can guarantee your food is really from the you trusted sources. So uh, this is like a perennial issue in halal food industry for, for many many years. Now, blockchain technology promised to uh, solve this by trace the oranges and uh, secure the data. Because once you store the data of the uh, food processing, production, and distribution, uh, you cannot change the data. Because if you want to change the data, 51% of the computers in the network have to agree to change the data. You cannot do. You cannot do. That's the beauty of the blockchain technology. 
So, however, the benefit of this solution uh, proposed by our team, uh, it's called Halal Chain uh, Technology, or HLC, um, uh, is um, to provide this integrity, transparency, and trust of the food chain, which will use uh, this technology to track, uh, tracking a product from source to consumer and quick deposit uh, com uh, position commodity branches and detect fraud code. And this will uh, involve uh, verification machines and medical devices and uh, borderline products. All this will be achieved uh, by digital verification with great transparency of product code on the blockchain principle. So again, I have to repeat, blockchain, blockchain principles is, are, is transparency, trust, and uh, uh, what is it called, um, a verifiability or uh, encrypt. So all these principles has a promise that can perfect fit to solve the halal food uh, industry issue. So here's a, a kind of a, a model proposed by halal food um, uh, halal chain actually, uh, halal, halal blockchain models, uh, taking the uh, M2C uh, manufacturer to consumer more of poultry meat, uh, meat production. So the whole data is stored on the blockchain from the farm to the dining table, supporting the bi-directional traceability. So if you want to uh, check, you know, for example, if you are a um, farmer, you want to trace your, where your chicken go, you know, and you can just log into this system and find out who consumed your chicken. And on the other hand, if you are a consumer and you can, um, you want to trace who produced this, you know, this chicken on my table today. So again, you can uh, log in the system and scan the barcode, then you find out where is the, you know, this uh, uh, poultry was produced. <clears throat> so so we, here we are using the IoT, um, you know, uh, collect data to ensure that source data is true. So this is one thing often um, being criticized by Ben is, oh, like, how can you, yes, we, we trust that once the data is on blockchain, on your network, it's all secure and trustworthy and uh, transparent, but how can you guarantee when you collect the data from the source, you know, from original, and then how that is uh, accurate and true, you know? So this we have to discuss uh, and in the second part is, which is IoT, Internet of Things, you know? When you use smart sensors, you use a monitoring system, you use human labor to guarantee all the data recorded from farm, from distribution, from processing, from consumer are correct. So let, let me walk you through very, uh, very um, briefly. First of all, we cultivate and breed, you know. Uh, here you use uh, the RFID and sensor and uh, uh, reader and uh, uh, location radar to control or control machine. So all this machine will be used to collect data, from, for example, from kid, uh, chickens, from cows, from all the sources. So this is the raw material uh, we are, uh, it's uh, supposed to uh, collect. Then these are data materials uh, will be fit into brand processing. So here we use sensor uh, quality report and uh, point account, we NFS uh, tags, you know, uh, to generate uh, the brand, you know, this brand uh, corresponding to the material we just collected from the source. And once this is uh, finished, we go to the third stage and we store and delivery. And uh, uh, we uh, use sensor NFS tags and application and the GPS to locate the, locate the food, you know, locate the food. And uh, uh, sorry, there's a little bit. Can you see me clearly still? So at the end, to the, uh, to, to, to the uh, you know, consumer, uh, 
uh, and in a consumer's end. So all in all these processes, you have, uh, again, you, it was guaranteed by this blockchain uh, thing called smart contract. What is smart contract? Basically, it's a, a con digital contract signed between the producers, distributors, and consumers. And it's all verified. This smart contract, including all the data mentioned above, and if one party breach this contract, and all the other um, parties will be notified, notified. So that's why it's guarantee that oh, I, I sold my chicken and halas. I don't. I, I have nothing to do with it. No, that's not in the blockchain system. You cannot cheat. You cannot breach your protocols. Your uh, your quality, you know, once you block and all this, the whole system will be notified by this breaching. And because of this, it can greatly reduce the transaction cost processing time and improve the quality and safety and uh, in, improve the transparency and confi confidence from the consumers. So it's added value to the halal food industry. And then it can bring the benefit to all the stakeholders in the food, halal food industry. Let me uh, see if how it's. Um, so if you develop, and this is how uh, uh, you know the actual app. You know, I'm using the halal halal food um, halal chain technologies uh, app to uh, to make the point. So first of all, you. For each product, each brand, you generate a unique QR will be printed on every product packaging, storing pictures and information about a particular product. Has this chicken, you know, in this package, has all the, once you scan the code, this, this um, information will all show on, the, on, on your app. And this, uh, it's including from A to Z, all the information. And it's, the beauty part is like, it's, all verified by blockchain technology. It's all transparent. You nobody can make a fake one and store there. You know, it's all true. Then users can scan the QR code and instant verify the authenticity of the product using the dedicated NDFDIC mobile application or any QR scan app. So this is a NDFDIC is the uh, the industrial use one. But if you want to use the other, like commonly accepted one, it's also fine. You know. That's then, uh, <clears throat> upon a scanning, you will get the relevant information and you can verify it. Yeah, you can verify it. So, so here's the blockchain. How much time I have? Uh, I hope. So, so it's uh, about to finish. Maybe you uh, can, should conclude your presentation. Okay, okay. give me one Thank minute out. So for the Thank smart you. sensors, it's like basically in this blockchain technology, we use smart sensor to uh, collect data, you know, about the meat, about the uh, production process. But the thing is, uh, how smart are they? Are they can really uh, get whatever information we need? So this is the remaining issue to be uh, solved. And secondly, will they replace certifiers? So I posed this ethical and uh, uh, question that will, you know, will machine and then IoT Internet of Things replace human inspection? human certifiers, you know, was human certifier be replaced by smart or not? So if if they are going to replace that, can we trust them? So this is the thing we need to be um, discussed. It's more like in a conceptual issue. And lastly, uh, let me uh, quickly work you with AI and food security and quality. So these are two pictures of using artificial intelligence to detect whether these airports are good or bad, you know? so. Using the artificial intelligence, basically you can sort, and you can sort and greeting the different levels of food. Whether this food is a, like a poor quality, good quality, the best quality, whether there's a insect inside the apple, whether the, this, there's a you know corruption inside this. So all we are using this uh, AI to scan it, then compare this this data with the the pattern already stored in the AI. Like, so we put the like standard good apple inside the system. And once you scan it, you can compare this pattern you know, with the standard in the system. Then you can tell whether this apple is good or bad. So similarly, we can use it in many other you know, halal food um, uh, 
sorting and uh, uh, expecting, inspecting. So here we, I proposed a few um, uh, issues about how AI can be applied in halal food industry. And first we need to have a big data, you know, global halal food, big data. And, and then we need to establish the standard, the service standard to compare uh, halal food with uh, the, compare the halal food with the, uh, the, with the data. Then we can grid, like grid different category, different levels of the halal food with uh, artificial intelligence. And the, the case study is like, uh, there's one uh, China Arab uh, food industrial park is uh, proposed uh, to establish in the UAE in Dubai. They want to use this smart technology to uh, solve the issues between um, if you importing like, you know, uh, hal uh, food, halal food from China, and then you knew the proposed to use this smart technology to solve uh, the, you know, uh, uh, issues. Okay, thanks for your attention and uh, uh, sorry for taking extra time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yusuf, yeah, for a very interesting about the blockchain, IoT and AI. I think this is a very key driver for, for the digital catalyst for Halan industry. Uh, but we have a very another interesting topics about the finance and money, right? Uh, then uh, I will introduce uh, Ms. Hong Sin Kwek, the founder and CEO of Sin Watana Crowdfunding, digital platform from Singapore. Uh, could you please uh, share your screen and uh, continue the session, please? Dr. Fredon, Dr. Fredon, yes. Cannot share. Some other people is uh, using. Ah, okay. Right. Uh, should be okay now. Okay. Okay, guys. I I introduced that she's in Singapore, but she's in Thai, and her <laughs> house is in Thai. <laughs> Um, I'd like to thank everybody, uh, particularly uh, Prof. Unai and T, and uh, specifically uh, Semper John yourself, and of course to all brothers and sisters uh, who are participating in this whole uh, Hala assembly, uh, particularly focusing on science and technology. And it is my privilege and honor. My name is Hong Sin, and uh, I've been working with uh, Atom Perdon for a while. Uh, we are exploring on serving the Muslim community in terms of support for uh, crowdfunding. And uh, I was just doing a very quick read uh, just yesterday about you know this whole entire landscape when we're looking at the total Islamic finance assets that are being estimated to be even 3.5 trillion in 2024. So when we talk about Islamic finance, uh, particularly we are talking about a very fast moving, fast booming segment of a global finance. And uh, where in which we are talking about an estimation of serving more than or near to about 1.8 billion uh, community, I mean, people and community. And here we're talking about uh, not just the global finance, but we are addressing actually also ethical finance. So this whole entire conversation is growing extremely uh, fast. And also uh, quoting from what Dr. Farida has mentioned about um, the growth of the Muslim community, it's not just about the, um, just the traditional growth, but also it could be also the marriages and the change of the whole entire landscape. In fact, earlier from the three uh, speakers, uh, particularly uh, Prof. Farida talks about the whole landscape and change where, um, you know, the, the, the key point here touch on um, the message on transparency, trust, friendly, equal quality, and also to be able to provide the empirical uh, research and science to prove uh, this whole food chain. And of course, uh, Prof. Panat addresses, you know, tailoring programs to serve very specific needs. 
And of course, our dear um, Yusuf uh, just mentioned about integrity and transparency. So what has it got to do with finance? It is a big conversation here. So um, because, you know, if we were to look at the whole entire landscape where we talk about disparity, where we talk about the poor, you know, and the rich, and how do actually crowdfunding comes in to serve this whole entire conversation to at least strike some kind of a balance. So take a look at, let's say, even the World Bank projection as far as crowdfunding is concerned, excluding the China uh, crowdfunding model, we are talking about a conservative 96 billion in the world. And moving on, where we are looking at Islamic crowdfunding platform, a Sharia compliant global crowdfunding platform, UT Pratiptai, as in that in Thailand, we have yet to have a platform like this. And that's also the reason why I've been in pursuit to uh, with Achan uh, Pradon and his team, or even the, the local Muslim community here, um, you know, to look into how we can actually serve this whole entire conversation. So in the world, you know, uh, the approved Islamic platform, you can find them all over the world, uh, particularly in uh, Australia, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia, uh, there's a whole chain of like the Iran, Libya, uh, Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Jordan, Egypt, even Australia, and of course uh, India. To, to no surprise, Prof. Farida mentioned about India. So all these other places that are growing tremendously and fast, you know, they are not ignoring crowdfunding. Uh, um, I'm not saying that Thailand is, but rather that we're taking a little bit more time, more cautious uh, in terms of adopting crowdfunding um, in the use under the conversation of Islamic crowdfunding. These are some of the global uh, case studies uh, where these are all is from, I extracted all these uh, from the Islamic platform. And, uh, you know, it ranges from all the way from the social aspect and into the conversation of investment and then off to peer-to-peer -to -peer money lending. And uh, all these things are happening because of this whole context of digital transformation. Uh, crowdfunding in Islamic finance and microfinance becomes are possible and accessible. And that's what I meant by being able to uh, give some level of uh, balance and also being able to cater for uh, accessibility for the underserved, the unbankable, or even the unknown. So in the context of like, uh, there is really a very distinctive trend uh, in terms of Islamic crowdfunding that emphasize a lot on delivering quality services, which was also emphasized by, um, I, I believe, uh, Dr. Farida, because she brought up a lot of points that just align to the whole entire context of principle of uh, crowdfunding. And um, where we talk about in, an, in, you know, the traditional finance is that, okay, you know, when people need money, they go to the bank to seek for a loan or credit card. When people, you know, uh, think about set, setting a business, they say, ah, you know, how about trading some equity or services to get some funds? Or, you know, they negotiate with a strategic partner to look for some funding, uh, especially those uh, customers that like the product, they are willing to part some of the money to invest in some of these startups. Or, you know, right now, uh, starting a crowdfunding campaign is the norm. And uh, we have a lot to catch up as compared to the global scene. Um, or join a startup or a, I mean, join an incubator or accelerator or solicit a venture capital if your business is already there. Or even to apply a local uh, angel investor group, you know, to get the angel interested in your business or to request for small grants. In certain countries in across uh, ASEAN or Asia, 
uh, basically seeking for government grant is quite a common activity, a common uh, act for a startup. Or pitch your need to your friends and family. And typically, this is quite common where people will seek for support from their relatives or their family. And uh, last but not least, if your pocket is deep enough, you can fund yourself to get the business going or to support, you know, any of the social costs. So when we touch on the subject of Islamic crowdfunding, inevitably, we have to review the possibility to work on Zakat, uh, Zadakat, and also uh, WAP. Okay, and in which when we talk about ob obligatory uh, charity, there are many other aspects to look at or the voluntary or even to review and to look or deep dive into Islamic endowment. So let me just share a few pointers as what I meant by crowdfunding principle aligned with very closely with this whole context and conversation of the uh, Islamic guidelines and rules. So in here, we're talking about it is fully equitable, all right, for investment and equity order, not that. Okay, crowdfunding, it emphasizes on sharing grief. Why? Because we're talking about the crowd. Um, when you put out a project, it can be social, all right, when it, the, the, the subject is true, transparent, with a clear uh, usage of the fund. All right, people are ready to come in. I will get on to describe a little bit more, but I give you the um, principal value first, okay? And uh, things like, you know, financing uh, offers a, a much more affordable cost compared to traditional finance. Uh, one of the things that I like to emphasize, crowdfunding is not a replacement, but rather crowdfunding is actually a complement to the traditional finance and it just fills the gap where uh, traditional finance were unable to do can be many reasons all right can be you know their infrastructure is too heavy all right um so uh when we talk about you know crowdfunding we generally open the possibility to have the uh, campaigners to actually tell the story and have the donors to give the money, okay? Or in the context of investment, it is where the investors comes in with the idea of supporting the business or the sectors that they wanted to invest. And on the condition on full transparency, but because I'm only given 20 minutes, so um, you know, this session, I will not be able to deep dive into how uh, this works, but I hope to be able to uh, work with Aston Pradhan and Jula to probably call for another workshop to share more uh, information with you. So when we talk about the crowd, uh, generally we are talking about also um, you need to cater for full transparency. So how the full transparency comes in is where the, all the entire documentation comes in to prove that this is what the business needs or this is what the social or the charity require. And more importantly, is that you really get to engage with the donors. Donors get to engage with the campaigners, similarly in the investment model, okay? And the whole entire platform basically cater for full transparency and track record with full audit trail uh, that, you know, you can trace back right from the angle of, right from the start of registration, all the way down to qualification before the project can even get posted onto the platform, okay? And of course, last but not least, where we talk about market discipline, where we talk about, you know, the market, meaning to say the crowd, all right, basically will be the one to actually do the validation to make sure that the right deals get funded uh, with full validation. Again, I want to emphasize and also the full verification. And uh, first in Watana, uh, we serve in the Thai market and right from day one, we actually focus a lot on the SDG aspect 
uh, because we believe in this whole conversation of bridging the gap. And particularly being in Thailand, we serve this whole and public conversation on sufficiency economy to ensure that, you know, we basically cater for where the underserved and the unbackable are. Uh, just to give a little background, we started off in 2013 and uh, we only got our license to operate in 2018. But since then, we have actually taken off uh, with uh, several projects. Um, and we have also several joint ventures to serve the market demand. When we talk about joint ventures, uh, we basically, and also the memorandum of understanding, uh, is basically to expand the outreach, not just by ourselves, but also with the people in the community who want to participate and leverage on crowdfunding to serve the area that we could have needs up. And uh, allow me to just quickly um, also mention crowdfunding, there are several types, okay? Social crowdfunding refers to donation and reward model. What do I mean by donation and reward model? Donation means a charity organization or a certain cause uh, are being conducted and they seek for donation. And uh, people give without expecting return people give without um, you know, asking for anything. So it's a gift of love and a gift for change. Reward model is the conversation of, I give the money in exchange of a product or in exchange of a service. So in the, in the uh, Hala community, there are a lot of amazing uh, product invention innovation. Uh, that have yet uh, to be catered for. Sorry. My battery is running a little low. Let me just, sorry. you get uh, you know the uh, product in return equity and debt security are all about investment and um, when it comes to equity and debt these are all uh, already common practices that is happening in the Islamic platform in the world so similarly for real estate as well as the conversation on blockchain these are just some of the payment gateway uh, that we uh, actually uh, offer on the crowdfunding platform in Thailand. And these are our collaborators. Uh, we have uh, Thailand Center Excellence Life Science and uh, the Thai Nichi uh, Institute. And um, also, you know, recently we inked with Council for Humanitarian Networking of uh, Sasko uh, Islam office. Um, and we have also Concordia and also Rocket Venture. So these are some of the uh, projects that we have conducted during the COVID where we supported the conversation of Green Mark. Um, and this project itself is an initiative that is conducted in Thailand. Um, where we talk about uh, during COVID, where they were rushing for N95 masks, but Thailand Center Excellence Life Science basically uh, came up with this whole invention, not just overnight, but they've been investigating on this. Um, and in which uh, during the COVID period, we raised about 2.8 million within 37 days. And um, the Another project, which is Food for Fighter. Uh, Food for Fighter itself is also during COVID, where we raised about 1.6 million uh, with 354 donors. And in this conversation itself, it was a restaurant, uh, restaurant owner uh, when there was a lockdown, 
uh, the restaurant owner actually took the initiative to call for all the other rest of the restaurant to come forward and she raised the fund uh, 50 boxes of lunch or breakfast or dinner pack for the hospital. So, so she actually supported the frontline uh, people. Um, and uh, of course, moving forward, these are basically the uh, investment for uh, crowdfunding. This is one of the projects that have raised 18.6 million. Uh, this is actually a restaurant chain uh, where they offer 50% of the company net profit back into the investors. And there is also Wealthy. This one is actually a nano, sorry, Pico Finance that loan money uh, for young people or elderly people who need just more money. Like maybe something like 250 baht or 5,000 baht, um, you know, so they cater for a very, um, a group of very unbankable uh, people. And uh, so the existing project that is running in uh, on a platform is actually also uh, a digital car matching platform uh, where um, they are seeking for 21 million and uh, offering 8.5%. So when we talk about crowdfunding, um, actually this is my last slide after Perdon, uh, is that, you know, there are a lot more that um, we can really offer to the Muslim community. Um, and uh, the context and conversation, like uh, we were working on one project that yet to be launched, but it is actually to create and build 100 house, houses, uh, affordable houses for down south. So um, there are a lot more that we can offer. Um, and um, I really look forward to actually working with Atan Perdon and the team to serve the Muslim community and um, having the right business uh, partner to actually bring forth and have the platform actually certified uh, to serve the Muslim community. So Atan Perdon, that's what I have uh, for today. Do I still have a lot of time? <laughs> uh Thank, thank you very much. I think this is perfect time. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you for sharing the knowledge and about the crowdfunding and sharing uh, interesting project. And, and uh, hopefully we can do more in terms of the uh, Sharia uh, crowdfunding in Thailand. Okay. Uh, I think our oh, speaker uh, very interesting and very, you know, respect the time. Uh, but because of we start uh, around 10 of to 15 minute delay, so I don't think we have much time for the questions. But uh, I have some, uh, uh, let's say, uh, one question in my inbox in the chat uh, about the crowdfunding. So maybe I can have only one uh, question for speaker. Uh, then the rest of the question from streaming uh, organizing team might contact the speaker directly for the answer. So apologize me uh, for for this. Uh, the question from in in uh, from my inbox is, uh, in your perspective, uh, Hong Sin, uh, what is the definition and the scope of the Islamic finance? Um, in my perspective of. Uh, um, Islamic finance and crowdfunding, or just Islamic finance? Yeah, Islamic finance uh, in, in, in global view. What, what, what do you think? Well, As you I, are not also not Muslim and, and you are working on the Sharia crowdfunding, so maybe it, you can share your opinion. It, it is, okay, Islamic finance is not something that uh, is rocket science. It's just that, you know, it is very, um, people find, I like to say that there is a fear or concern on how to serve in this whole Islamic conversation. The very key thing is that um, I grew up in a Muslim uh, Muslim environment and I have a lot of friends. And when we talk about Islamic finance, I think like what uh, Prof mentioned, that we need to learn 
we need to educate ourselves. We need to be able to understand in order to be able to serve. You know, it is not just hopping in and say, oh, I want to do this without understanding. So that's the reason that why I, you know, I don't just say, oh, we, we can do this or we can do that. We need Oh, okay, I think uh, the signal from Hong Xin was lost. Uh, she was answering the very nice question from her heart, <laughs> but but sorry for for losing the signal. Uh, okay, not sure that she can connect back very soon. Uh, then, uh, any other question? We we still have like two or three minutes for the question from the organizing team. If you have any question from from the the one who are watching on Facebook or streaming, YouTube, uh, I think we can have uh, one more question. Okay. So if there is uh, no further question from, from the organizing team and from, from the streaming, I would like to thank you all the keynote speaker today, Professor Farida, uh, Dr. Panat, uh, Dr. Yusuf, and, and Ms. Hongxin, uh, she was left because of the signal. Uh, thank you very much for joining. I think this is very fruitful uh, knowledge and very, you know, very interesting topic on the digital catalyst and resilience of the future of Halan industry. And thank you every, all, all the audience for participating in this uh, session. And as the MC told you that we will have a one hour uh, lunch break and uh, duly prayer. And we will join again at uh, uh, 2 p.m. Oh, I have a chat box that someone would like to talk to you, uh, Professor Farinda. Maybe you can uh, stay longer in the in the Zoom uh, room. Okay. So thank you very much, everybody, uh, and and stay safe. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much for our wonderful presentation. Thank you all speakers. Thank you moderator, Dr. Paradon Suri Pong. Thank you very much. To all participants, I would like you to uh, please complete the online evaluation form with scan the QR code on the right hand side of the screen. Okay, all right, everyone. It is time for lunch break and Zuri prayer and the conference we resume at 2 p.m. I will see you in one hour and a half later. Thank you.